So let's go on and talk about radiation dose. So as I mentioned in, our la in the last talk, we were focusing on image quality, but there is a subsection of image quality that is affected by radiation dose. So if you, for example, change the tube voltage, you know, the MA, the, the pit, well, the pitch is a small way, but like the, the detector coverage, you do change some of these things, you will affect image quality, but you'll also affect radiation dose. Excuse me. And the other thing that it's gonna be, the other thing that will affect the radiation output is the actual patient themselves, you know, how big they are, how much they weigh, and certain factors that we need to take into account when it comes to risk, such as maybe age and gender. These are all part of this optimization effect that optimization question that we need to consider now for the dose side of the equation. So we're going to talk about basically the same concepts that we just talked about earlier, you know, the bow tie filter, uh, KV, all these things, but how do they now affect image quality? Excuse me, not image quality, but radiation dose. So to ask the same question I started out with in the last, le in the last um, lecture was how constant is the radiation output on the system? So we saw in my first plot of noise, it was pretty constant over time which means that the system is giving the same radiation dose. If you type in, you know, 100 MA, it's pretty consistently always giving 100 MA. So I asked the same question now, how, how does the CTI value vary as a function of KV? 80, 100, 120, and 135 are the four standard outputs for our CT scanners. And looking at, once again, over approximately 340 days in 2020, the outputs for those four, when I typed in a very specific number, were constant. And that's good. That is a very good thing. This is something that's A, important for you guys to establish. This is kind of where your medical physicists will make sure that the system output is always constant. Because if there is variation in the machine output, you can go in and you can set your protocols. You can optimize your, re your reconstruction kernels for soft tissue. You can get the right KV. You can do everything right. But if the machine is variable, your output, your image quality, all that's variable too. So always go back, make sure your systems are, are constant. And these systems, these scanners, they really have been, obviously they've been built since the seventies and you know, fast forward almost 50 years these scanners are really good scanners. And so I would say that, yes, they are pretty constant. And so we could, should have a lot of confidence in the way we image. All right, I alluded to the fact that when we consider radiation dose optimization, probably one of the biggest bang, the biggest ways we can reduce radiation, unnecessary radiation dose to our patient population is actually to ask not how low can we go, but where should we target the use of radiation? So what is the right level of radiation dose? What is the right level of image quality? So here's just, just an example. If I need to see this leak right here, can I see that in this quality image with a CTDI vol of 2.76 versus the exact same but now imaged at 14.2. Did we change the diagnostic confidence? Did we change the sensitivity and specificity of our radiologists by reducing the dose by a factor of seven? The answer is, I assume, no. I'm not a radiologist, I have to openly admit, but I can basically see the same leak <laughs> in both of these images. And so in my naive eyes, I don't think this patient needs seven times the radiation dose for the task. And so being able to tailor the right amount of dose for the right image quality is probably one of the more key, cru the more crucial questions that we need to establish in our optimization team. When the, and that's why we need a radiologist, we need a technologist, we need a physicist, and we need some computer IT specialists. All right. So. Now let's get back into the specifics. So we talked quite a bit about the bow tie filter. 
why is it essential that we put the patient at the center more so than putting the anatomy we're imaging at the center? So we're not centering it on the heart. You know, we're not pushing the, the spine up or down. We want to put the patient at the center. And here is one of the reasons why. If I put, so here in the center is a nice, nicely centered patient. So we do our localizer CT. Here we did a nice anterior posterior. We can see the image, arms up. Yeah, okay, that's great. The CT, the the technologists that will be able to go and put their, you know, their scan field of view on this, and they can plan and they can go forward with that. But what happens if the patient was accidentally put a little too close to the X-ray tube? So they're off-centered high. Well, if you off-center the patient high, and then we do that same localizer, the patient actually physically looks larger in this image than this image. And that is because of the magnification artifact. If you have a detector here and an x-ray tube here, the closer you get to the tube, x-ray tube, or the farther away you get from the, <clears throat> excuse me, the detector, the bigger the patient looks. We see this all the time in planar radiography. When the patient goes up and hugs the, the, uh, the detector and we're doing a PA chest, well, the heart is bigger. If we flip them around and do an anterior posterior, now, you know, their backs to the detector, their heart's smaller. Yeah, it's the same effect. But as we will talk about in a moment, the system plans how much radiation to use based off of the localizer. And so when this patient looks bigger, obviously physically they're not bigger. The, the patient's actually the same size as you see here. But the system is now going to plan to use more radiation because it appears bigger. So if we had centered on the spine, well, the spine would be in the center, but the overall patient, you know, the bulk of the patient, most of the abdomen and the chest would be higher up. Therefore, it would appear bigger. So that patient would overall get more radiation dose. Here, I just simply took an, excuse me, I simply took and I measured, I, I took my ion chamber and my phantom <clears throat> and I moved them up to 50 centimeters high too high. And then um, as I go left on this plot, I lift lowered them basically 50 centimeters lower. And so you can see how the radiation dose changes. And this, I looked, I used an adult phantom and I used just a pediatric 10 year old phantom. And so overall the dose goes up much faster when you go too high than if you accidentally put them too low. And so this is kind of that, my apologies. Dr. Panu Tai mentioned what happens if you put a little teeny baby on the scanner and you don't build it up, put blankets, they just kind of sink down. <laughs> well, that means they're going to appear if they're too low and the scanner is the, the, the patient is too low, closer to the detector than the x ray tube, they're going to actually appear a little smaller. Now, they the system will think, well, if it's smaller, they don't, I don't need to use as much radiation. So the patient actually will get less radiation. So maybe that's a good thing, but the noise will go up. And the, 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 the good thing, I guess, is if we're off-center too low, the noise doesn't go up that fast. It's only just a little bit off. But if we go up even just 5, 10 centimeters too high, you see here 5 centimeters too high, the dose goes up really quick. And so getting the patient centered is more crucial for the radiation dose, I think, Yes, it prevents the artifacts that we saw in those spine phantoms in my previous talk, but also by just getting the patient wrong, wrongly placed in the scanner really truly affects the patient dose output. All right, so the next thing I uh, want to talk about is setting up the right acquisition factors. So we're going to... Um, I'm sorry, this slide is out of order. I thought I had moved this slide when I prepared my talk. All right, I will explain this slide, but it's actually, um, this slide is meant to go in when we talk about reconstruction. My apologies, this is out of order. All right, when we go to set up how thick we want the image when 
we give it to the radiologist to look at, you know, standard for an abdomen, it's going to be somewhere around three to five millimeters. So in the Z axis, that means we're averaging three to five millimeters of the patient together. And that's what we see transaxially in this image. Now, every system, when we use automatic tube current modulation, every system uses a, va a value that establishes how much noise we will allow in the image. So for example, GE uses noise index or NI, Canon uses SD for standard deviation, Siemens uses the, qual uh, the quality reference mass, Philips has something kind of similar to that too. That's why I didn't list theirs. And so if you go in and you say, I want a noise index of say 30, and I'm going to, in the end, have a five millimeter thick image, the system knows how much MA to use when they do the tube current modulation as it spins around the patient. And you get the image on the right hand side. It looks nice, I hope. I think you think that would look good. Now, what happens if we use that same noise index value, but we reconstruct it at a different thickness. In this case, the thinnest we can go on a GE scanner is 0.625. Obviously, the image is much, much noisier because the tube, the radiation output was assuming that we were going to average up to five millimeters of tissue together. So like, uh, so Dr. Pandrutai was kind of talking, asked this question about the reconstruction kernel. In similar, in a similar way, we have to, when we sit down to optimize our protocols, we have to think, well, how thick am I going to want my images? Do I want the end result to be, say, five millimeters or three millimeters? And if I do, then when we program in the right, the right noise values, the target values, then the system can pick the right MA. And so um, my apologies, that's a little out of order. Hopefully we can talk a little bit about that again when we get to reconstruction. So we had gone from, originally we were talking about the bow tie filter and then we talked about KV. So we're back to KV. So let's talk a little bit about KV and how that changing going from one KV to another, how does that affect us? Well, I mentioned that as you go, you can kind of see from this plot, if you go from one KV value, say 135 down to 80 KV, the machine output, in this case CTDI vol, decreases exponentially. And so this assumes a constant MA. So if I'm using 100 MA as an example, but I change the KV, the dose output considerably comes down. And so this is one of the benefits of using low KV. Now, we already talked about how it improves the contrast. So why does the dose go down when we use KV? Well, we know, you know, mathematically, KV changes as a quadratic. It's a square value. So let's take an example here. If I want to reduce my KV from 120 to 80, so I reduced it by 40 value points. So if I divide 80 by 120 and I square it, I get a reduction, a dose reduction of around 56%. <clears throat> we know that MA or radiation dose, it changes linearly. So if I make that same change, 80 MA versus 120 MA, but because there's not a square value, it's not quadratic, I actually only get a 33% dose reduction. Now this is a benefit. We're gonna talk about this in a minute. But the fact that the KV changes dose faster than MA changes linearly is a benefit to us. Now, the converse happens. If you're going higher, if you're going 100 to 120 to 135 or 40, the higher up you go, the faster dose will increase. So just a comment, just as, you know, this is just a physics property, a principle you need to remember. When we change MA, it affects dose and image noise. But when we have changed KV, it affects dose and image noise and image contrast. And so changing that MA dial doesn't really adjust the contrast we see in the image. So <clears throat> we've already talked about how imaging with low KV, and I actually showed this with my one plot of phantoms, the lower the KV you go when you keep MA the same, the images just get noisier. And that's because the 
as we go down in KV, the photons coming out of the x-ray tube are less energetic. That means they don't penetrate as well. Now, it's a good thing in the sense if they don't penetrate as well, they get absorbed easier in things like bones or iodine concentra- uh, uh, contrast in the, in, the, in the liver parenchyma or, you know, in our, in our vasculature. And so we get a better contrast, inherent contrast in the image. But that means we get less photons at the detector. And less photons at the detector means our image quality doesn't look as good. <clears throat> so what we can do is we can take into account the fact that KV dose changes faster with KV than it does with MA. And so if I have a value here, I'm going to image, if my protocol is currently established at 120 KV and the average value is 100 MAS, I just, let's just say it's 100 MAS through the body. If I go in and I measure the noise content, so I put an ROI kind of somewhere in the center of the body, the value is going to be somewhere like 7.6. It's just, it's just an example. The output, the radiation dose, or the CTD volume CTDI value is, in this example, when I scanned this phantom, was 6.8. Now, <clears throat> I want to do that same change. I want to reduce from 120 to 80 kV. Now, if I hold my MA output the same, well, yeah, look, the image is less appealing. It's noisier. My noise content went up. Now, I got a great dose reduction, as we predict. But the image quality went down. Radiologists, as much as they are all about lower radiation dose, they are not all about reducing their image quality too. They need to still be able to do their job. And so what happens if I reduce down to 80 kV, but I keep my noise roughly the same? Well, the only way to keep the noise the same is I have to actually increase my MA or my output, my radiation output. And so I did increase it. But because KV changes as a quadratic, whereas MA changes linearly, look at my volume CTDI. It didn't go up as fast. So 80 KV, I will have better image contrast. My iodine enhanced contrast tissue will pop better. I'll be able to see smaller structures that are, are contrast enhancing better. The noise content will be mostly the same, but I did get a dose reduction. And so that is one of the benefits of using lower KV. All right, so let's move on. We talked about, I already showed you this slide, we talked about um, using in helical mode, uh, imaging in helical mode. So the, I asked this question, but I did not answer it. I said, does pitch affect patient dose. So if I'm imaging at a high pitch, there's areas of the body that are not being exposed. So you would think, oh, it's lower dose, right? And there are, if we do a pitch less than one, we're over, we're imaging certain parts of the body twice as it spins, spins through going really slow. So you would think, oh, well, wait a minute, radiation dose must be higher. And the answer is, that is not correct. I mentioned to you, all of our little kids are imaged at pitches less than one. So, so that would mean every one of our little kids were being overexposed, but it's not true. So why is that? It's because when we turn on our tube current modulation, we have to tell that algorithm, we have to tell the software how much noise we want in the image. Remember those values, NI, SD, that quality reference mass QRM, which is a Siemens one, but it's kind of the same for Philips. So those four values, you as a optimization team, radiologist, technologist, physicist, potentially a, uh, um, a computer specialist, you need to be able to decide how much noise is acceptable in an image. When you set those values, then the system will tell Will the, the, the algorithm, the software, the protocol will tell the CT scanner how much MA to use. So if I have a pitch of less than one, the body is being scanned or oversampled in some places more than once. Therefore, it doesn't need as much MA per rotation. So it will reduce its overall amount of MA. 
if the pitch is greater than one, that means there are times when certain parts of the body are not exposed at all and other parts that are exposed. Well, if we're going to be averaging the d data between two adjoining sets of data, well, those two sets of data need to be high quality. And because they've been partially undersampled, we need to actually increase the MA. So for pitch values greater than one, MA is increased. The net result is that noise and radiation dose is the same when you look at it across the whole field of view. So pitch less than one, we're oversampling, but the dose is lower. So we keep the same noise and the same total dose to the tissue. Pitch greater than one, well, we have to increase it a little bit, but that's only increasing it for part of the patient, not all of the patient. And so once again, noise is the same, dose is the same. Only if you go way back in the day, and I don't know if you guys have any CT scanners that are single slice anymore. So not the multi-slice, multi-detector detect, uh, CT scanners of today. You go back in the early, the late 90s and early 2000s, back when they had single slice CT scanners, that was when pitch changed dose. If you have a single slice CT scanner and pitch is less than one, dose goes up. If pitch is greater than one, dose goes down. But it's only for your single slice CT scanners, which admittedly most scanners are not today. I don't know if you have really old scanners somewhere in some small little clinic out in the middle of nowhere. If you do, then you have to be careful. <laughs> Changing your pitch will definitely change your dose. But for everyone else, you set the right pitch to get the right quality of image you need. All right, so when you break it down and you look at all of the tools that we have in CT, bar none, the tool that gives you the best dose management is tube current modulation. And so we want to make sure we get this one very well optimized, especially for the body because we really have to modulate because our body's changed quite a bit from the chest down to the abdomen, lateral compared to anterior posterior. We are elliptical by nature. And so therefore radiation coming down anterior posterior versus laterally will be so much, it will be very much different. And that is where tube current modulation really is one of the most amazing pieces of technology on the CT scanner. As the machine, as the gantry, as the x-ray tube spins around the body in one single plane, the system is able to reduce the amount of MA and increase it very quickly to the point where it can, it can sculpt and it can put the right amount of radiation dose through the patient at the right thickness. And this is a way to keep the same amount of photons at the detector no matter how thick or thin the patient is as it spins around. And the whole goal here is not necessarily just in one image, but obviously as we go down through the body, so through Z axis, as we're constantly spinning around the various different thicknesses of the body, we're trying to keep the noise basically the same as we go from various different thicknesses of the body. Now, we've talked about how tube current modulation, it modulates as it spins around our body, which is why you see in this curve, you see this, the, the uh, constant undulation or constant uh, uh, variation going up and down. The top of this, this curve represents the thicker, kind of the lateral sides of our body. And the lower body, the lower part of this curve represents the thinner aspects, maybe the anterior posterior. But also, obviously, Obviously, as we know, as you're going through different parts of our body, you know, through the shoulders, we're real thick, so we need a lot of output. But then when we get into the larger con uh, larger part of our, of our chest, which is mostly air, we really don't need a lot of radiation. And then abdomen and pelvis gets into some soft tissue and bony. So we're able to change the amount of radiation as we spin around our body and as we go through our body. You guys know this. That's tube current modulation. I, it, it's been around since the mid nineties and it's standard. Your system has tube current modulation. If for whatever reason you are still using fixed MA protocols in the body, 
uh, I would challenge you to consider changing those protocols. We talked about there are times when they're okay. And, you know, I, for example, we use those in our head. But like I mentioned at the very beginning of today, <laughs> the head is pretty constant for all patients of, of similar age. And so you can kind of get away with using one MA and one KV for a specific protocol just because that head is going to be the same. But my chest, my abdomen is going to be different than your chest and your abdomen. And so you really want the system to be able to modulate and spin around. All right. So how do the various different vendors set up their dose modulation or their tube current modulation? I thought it would be important to talk about this just so you understand how they all function when you set up the parameters. Because I mentioned once you, you have to set up those noise index parameters, NI, SD, the, the quality reference mass that they use for Siemens and kind of like they do in Philips, you need to know what to set for what type of image you're going to get. And then you need to understand how the MA is going to change and how the noise, which I'll show you on the next slide, is affected by it. So there was an, this paper that came out, uh, if you go to mhra.gov.uk, this is a study that came out from the UK. They use this, this conical plastic, or it's a, yeah, plastic phantom. In other words, it's a constantly changing diameter phantom. And so you, that's why you see here along the x-axis, different patient diameters going from really teeny, you know, five centimeters, which is not even a patient, maybe an arm, up to a uh, relatively thick 250, 300 MA, uh, millimeters or 25, 30 centimeters. So the thicker or the, the more attenuating patients are on the right side, the thinner on the left side. And then along the Y axis is machine output, tube current or radiation dose output. So if we dial in a constant MA, obviously you get a constant plot right across horizontally. Now, you get these curves. So I'm gonna focus on GE and Canon. They basically have the same idea. GE calls it the noise index. Canon calls it the SD or the standard deviation. It does the same thing. And so you're telling the system how much noise you want in the image. And then the system will pick the amount of output radiation. So if you have, if, if you dial in, let's say a noise index of 10 or a standard deviation of 10, and your patient is somewhere over here at say 20 centimeters. Well, this system knows for that slice thickness, it's gonna use about 150 MA. Now, it, obviously you're gonna be moving up and down this curve. As the patient gets thicker, say in their abdomen and pelvis, it's gonna go swing higher and use higher MA. And as they get thinner or maybe through the chest or where there's lots of lung, it's gonna come down and it's gonna use less MA. And so tube current modulation, when you pick the noise index value or the standard deviation for a G and Canon, it moves up and down that curve. Now, if you have a different protocol that needs to be less noise or higher noise, then you pick a different noise index and it picks a different curve. The way GE and C, uh, Canon work is the higher the number, the more noise the system will allow. And that's what you can see here. This system at an NI of 20 or an SD, you know, close to 20, it doesn't ever use as much MA. Even for the largest patient it, in this phantom, it doesn't use a real high MA. Therefore, the image is going to be noisier. You can also see that these curves are a lot more for the higher, the, excuse me, the lower NI values that require less noise in the image. Those curves move more aggressively. And so small changes in patient thickness will change the radiation output faster. So you just have to ask yourself that question. Can this imaging task that we're doing, can we do it with, with lots of no or more noise than not? Therefore, we pick a higher NI or a higher SD. And are we as concerned that this patient could swing from really thick to really thin and therefore the dose could be very, very um, extreme. So the other thing to consider, Siemens, 
they do it slightly different where they actually will select a different uh, curve that will tell, will tell the system how much MA to use once again, based on how thick the patient is. And they call it the weak, average, or strong curves. You can see that they all converge to the same output value as the patient gets thicker. So for very, very big patients, our obese patients, it really doesn't matter which curve you use in Siemens. They, the output is still the same. But when you get down here to like the little kids, mostly pediatrics, then if you want to be more aggressive in how quickly it changes radiation dose, you would pick a strong curve. So it'll start low, but it could end up really high faster. Whereas a weak curve, it will start maybe a little higher, but no as the patient goes from maybe thin to thicker, thicker, it actually doesn't change as much in the output. And then Philips is kind of the same way where you pick a quality reference dose image or image quality based on a reference patient thickness. And then the system will pick the MA trying to match that same noise. So if we say for this size, roughly this size patient, we want a specific noise value well, the system knows it needs about 200 MA. So if the patient is much bigger, it knows it needs to basically double the dose. If it's much smaller, then it knows it has to lower the dose. So it's kind of the same concept. It's much simpler. Philips is probably the simplest one of them all. All right, so that's how it works. What does that mean in the end product? What does noise look like in the end product? So let's once again look at GE and Canon. For GE, for the most part, so now we have noise on the y-axis, measured standard deviation. This is the amount of, if you have a re reconstructed image, let's say of the liver, and I put an ROI in the middle of that liver, not on vasculature, but just kind of in the parenchyma, what is the standard deviation of that ROI? That's how much noise or variability is in the image. That's our y-axis now. Same x-axis, which is patient thickness. So if I pick, once again, a noise index of 10 or a standard deviation of 10, for GE, the, it's mostly the same. It's mostly flat. It does change a little bit. In other words, GE is doing its best to keep the noise constant as you go from thin to thick anatomy. It's trying to keep it mostly the same. It does vary a little bit. Obviously, as you get higher and higher in dose, it's hard, I mean, excuse me, and thicker and thicker in patient it's not as easy to keep the exact same noise. But for the most part, it does a pretty good job. All the other vendors, Canon, Siemens, and Philips, they fundamentally do it a little differently. When you pick, for example, an SD of 10 on Canon, and the patient gets thicker, so it's going from maybe chest to the abdomen to the pelvis, it actually allows more noise in the thicker more the larger parts of the body than the thinner. And that's consistent across all of the SD values, maybe except for the really, really little ones. And the point here is, as you get bigger, it's, a plan, it's, it's assuming that there's going to be more, for example, fat in your body, or there's just going to be more space between all of the tissue. And if there is, for example, interstitial fat, or you know, there's fat padding around your, your, your organs, then you will be able to easily see this is liver, that's spleen, this is kidney. It's all kind of easy to see. And therefore, if it's a little bit more noisy, you haven't changed your ability to see contrast. And you see the same thing with Siemens. As you get bigger, Irrespect, uh, the patient gets bigger, irrespective of the strength of curve, strong, average, weak, the noise always goes up. And then the same thing with Phillips. So I think it's very important to understand these basic fundamentals. So when you go and set a certain NI value or a SD value, and you measure the output, you know, the noise, and you go, oh, hey, I was expecting a 12. <laughs> well, the reality is, you don't actually get a 12 anywhere but at the thinnest patients. It might actually go as high as you know 18 or 19, even though the SD value is predicting a noise index of 12. 
you just need to understand kind of how and where it's affected in the overall image quality. So when you set your optimization technique, you know how to set it right. Okay. Now we talked about organ dose modulation last week. So I went over to my scanner. I threw my, uh, my volunteer on my little phantom and I imaged it when I turned on, and this is a cannon. So I turned on the organ dose modulation here and then I scanned the guy again and turned off my organ dose modulation. And here you can see the MA curve. So this is my Z axis tube current modulation based off of this localizer. You can see obviously the MA is gonna go up real high here. And that is because we got these beautiful shoulders right here. And you can see that this is much higher. Therefore the MA is much more extreme or more strong through this region than it is here. And that's because what you don't see is I turned this organ dose modulation on. So it's, ex it's doing its best to reduce the overall MA in this region because of what would presumably be breast tissue. The same could be true for obviously thyroid and the eyes, which we talked about for the for the um, for the head yes last week. So, what does that look like? Um, GE provided this. I thought it was just a good way to graphically see this or pictorially see this. So here's a transactional view of the of a chest of the thorax, and for the most part, the dose is much lower here anterior, so the breast tissue is definitely getting less radiation, but basically so is everything else anterior to the center of the body. And then on the bottom side, dose is just the same. It's always what it was and nothing changes. And there was a great question last week about, well, could we use this organ dose modulation in say a pediatric patient? And the answer is definitely. I, and I'll, I'll share my caveat to that in the next slice. But here you can see, if I use the same angle, so I turn it on instead of imaging here in the chest, I'm imaging down here in the abdomen. You can see the same angle. This area would reduce the dose by somewhere 30 to 40%. And so in this case, most of the fetus would probably be spared some amount of radiation. Now that's assuming the fetus is nice and centered. And that's also assuming that the patient is centered in the image, in the, in the scanner. Do not be tempted to remove the phantom, excuse me, the phantom, the patient. Don't move the pregnant woman higher into the scanner so that more of the, more of the fetus would reduce, would um, be, uh, you would be um, spared radiation dose due to organ dose modulation. Because remember, when you move the, the woman, the mother up, the system's going to think she's bigger. So therefore, it's going to compensate by putting more MA or more radiation out. So even though you moved it up, so you get more of the baby, the fetus into this area that is quote unquote lower dose, you've actually just told the system to turn out the dose. So it, it's actually potentially you're increasing the dose to the patient, to the, to the fetus and definitely to the mother. So Organ dose modulation also requires you to get that patient, get the, in this case, the mother, nice and centered. Now, I mentioned that GE and Canon, when they use organ dose modulation, they simply turn it down as it sweeps anteriorly, and then they just turn it back to normal posterior. So I think it's a perfectly good and legitimate time reason to use organ dose modulation in a pediatric, a, a pregnant woman. But my only thing I said was you have to be careful and I'm not trying to be disparaging towards Siemens, but the way they approach it is different. Their version is called X-Care. Here you can see on the left, there was a study. Here's the publication if you want to read it, where they used Monte Carlo. So they looked at the radiation dose per voxel in this, in this mother, in the, excuse me, not mother, but this woman. And you can see the e relatively even distribution, high doses are white medium doses are yellow, low doses are red. And so the superficial tissue is here in yellow and that's getting the, it's getting relatively dose. And as the dose gets, as you get more centered to the body, the dose goes down. That's just because of attenuation. Now, if you turn X care on, the anterior aspect of the patient is getting less radiation. But when it spins over, the X-ray tube goes to the back of the patient, posteriorly, the dose goes up. That's just part of the way they do it. Their goal is to put the same amount of dose at the center of the body. Now, 
my only issue with that is look at this breast tissue right here. Part of this breast actually got more dose than this breast that got lower dose. So, okay, did we, did we probably over the net value reduce the overall dose of the breast? Yeah, most likely. There's more breast tissue here that got less dose, but this part of the tissue got higher dose. And I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. And then that's just assuming this breast could be even more pendant and more of it could be outside of the field of view. And so this is why I say <clears throat> it's a caveat to using, using this organ dose modulation option in a pregnant woman, because you just don't know where that fetus is until you scan it. And so this case, for example, um, there is the potential that this part of the body right here and this part of the body right here would actually get more radiation. And so there is a small potential that even though you're reducing the dose up here, down here, you're actually increasing it. So you just have to be a little bit more careful uh, where you use that technology. All right. So this is that one slide I was talking about doing uh, slice thicknesses. My apologies. It was supposed to be right here. So we talked about how uh, you have to know kind of how thick you want the slice so that you can set your proper noise index value at the beginning. I'm just giving you guys a very simple equation here. It's applicable for both GE, their noise index, and Canon, excuse me, their SD value. So if you ever want, excuse me, if you ever want to know what the dose would do if you're changing noise index, then if you use this simple equation, I give you an example here. So let's say we're gonna go from a noise index of 10 and I want to increase it to 15. My current CTDI vol, my volume CTDI value is five. Well, if I change it from 10 to 15, therefore it's gonna allow more noise in the image and I will basically get a dose reduction. And so my dose will basically be halved. Now, conversely, if you go from uh, 10 and you drop it to a five, well, obviously the number is going to go higher. So you can kind of use this equation. It'll give you, as I say, a rule of thumb, it'll get you really close to guessing what you need if you want to just start playing with, you know, it's like, hey, I can accept a little bit more noise in this image, so I'll reduce, I'll increase my noise index. What kind of dose reduction will I get? You can do these calculations without actually making any changes. So what happens if you're also thinking about changing, now I want to go from a five millimeter image to a three millimeter image. And so my noise index was, was 10, is 10, but now I'm gonna change my value from five millimeters to three millimeters. So it's a thinner image. My new noise index equivalent would be 13. Therefore, the noise will increase by about 30% or 13 divided by 10. And so from going from a thicker to a thinner image, the overall image quality will change. So this just is a way to kind of give you a sense if you're changing overall thicknesses. I simply give you these equations as just kind of a tool to play with. All right. So in just the last few slides, let's talk about how we talked, uh, Tanya asked the question, can deep learning and iterative reconstruction too, but deep learning, how does that affect our dose. So the first thing you could do if you get deep learning on your CT scanners, and I hope someday you do get them, and I hope you like them. I mean, just you've only seen a couple of my images. <laughs> so hopefully you get it, you get to play with it, and you get to decide if you like it. But if you do like it and you do turn it on, the first thing you can do is just simply turn it on. And what happens? Overnight, your image quality goes from what you see on the left to the image quality you see on the right. Now, it'll obviously vary, it depends on what your image quality baseline looks like. So the most fundamental thing you can do is you're not going to change radiation dose output to the patient. And the reason I would even bring this up is this image quality right here is probably kind of borderline low. We have historically, <laughs> Tanya is a pediatric radiologist and we got, we got Panutai, we got all these other pediatric radiologists that we have said radiation to kids is bad. So you poor radiologists have to look at really noisy images. That's just, that's what we said about 20 years ago. <laughs> so our poor pediatric radiologists have gotten used to looking at really noisy images. 
Now, would they prefer to look at less ra noisy radio images? Probably. And so do we absolutely need to go and immediately turn down the dose? Probably not. I think we're at a point in most of our institutions where we've brought the dose decently low. We've seen your guys' dose, your diagnostic reference levels as a, as a, uh, as a country, your values are actually middle to low, which means you guys are probably doing really good. And so turning this on improves the image quality. So the images that may be a little, be a little extra noisy because you have reduced your dose, well, we're going to get rid of that noise for you and hopefully make it a little better for you. But like Tanya said, what if we do want to keep moving that dose needle down? Yes, we have the we have a lot of flexibility now. So here I took in this patient, I actually didn't change the dose. This, I, this is just pure computer calculations. What if I take this patient that is currently getting imaged at, th it's got a three millimeter thick image, it's got a CTDI vol value that creates an image quality that looks like this. And let's just say our radiologists, they have been looking at these noisy images so long that they're okay with it. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to do my best to match that noise output. But by doing so, I can use ACE to fix that extra, so I can reduce my dose, and, th and then I can use ACE to clean up that extra noise. And so we've calculated out to be somewhere in the 40 to 50% range of dose reduction potential by simply turning on deep learning and then matching your current noise values to what you're using now. Now that means for like a GE or a Canon, you would go into your noise index or your SD value and you would actually increase it. But then you would turn deep learning on and it would decrease your noise. So there would be a change, you would have to make a change in your protocols. And then one day Siemens will eventually come out with this technology probably, and you'll have to do it slightly different for them. So where have we gone? And this is, this is kind of just a fun slide I like to show. Let's look at this 10 years ago. 10 years ago, when basically everyone was filter back projection, everyone, pre-iterative reconstruction, look how far we've come in about 10 years. We are to the point now where if we use deep learning for dose reduction purposes, we could probably be imaging 70 to maybe even 90% of what we used to 10 years ago. That means only we're using only about 30, 10 to 30% of the radiation we did 10 years ago. And so that's why I say by way of dose, we have come down quite a bit. Can we always go lower? Definitely. And would that help us in peace of mind and risk analysis? Definitely. But I would also say we're at that point where we've come down so low. Let's focus a little bit on image quality. Let's just ask ourselves, can we make it that much better for our radiologists? And then maybe get a little bit of dose reduction with that. So I've been mentioning this whole time how you guys are just, in Thailand, you guys are doing great. When you look at your overall national DRLs compared to what you see, you know, rolling around, you know, Japan and Korea, Malaysia, so your local, regional, and then compare that to, you know, America and the UK and whatnot, Australia. You know, you guys are kind of right in the middle, maybe just a little lower than the, the total global average. And so that's a great thing. That gives you the chance to really focus in on your body CT imaging on maybe focusing a little bit more on image quality. And so we've talked quite a bit about how we apply the DRLs. And so I'm not going to really belabor this point, but I think it's important to remember because this is a dose, diagnostic reference level talk <laughs> or session, you know, the whole several months we're doing this, is once you have these DRLs now, as Dr. Pandru Tai and her team start to disseminate that information out to all of Thailand, you'll have the opportunity to look at your local institutional CTs. And then you'll be able to compare them to this threshold. This threshold is the new Thai DRL. And you can look at how you compare at your specific hospital, your institution, and then you can start to focus in on this little top part. As there's going to probably be some protocols on most of your scanners that are above the DRL. And then you can work on those. 
And the vast majority of optimization then for the green stuff will come later when you look at maybe image quality and maybe, maybe dose reduction. And the way you approach that is once you are working, uh, looking at each of your scanners, it's another thing to do is how do your scanners compare to each other? So if I take a routine chest, or you could even do um, like was brought up earlier, if you're doing uh, a surveillance chest where you're looking at really low dose chest for you know cancer, uh, cancer screen. How is each, how is that one protocol being performed on every, every one of your CT scanners? Is so it doing kind of like a little pie chart like this? You can see in this example there. My apologies. Their CT scanner, their CT1, whatever that's labeled, for the same protocol as all the others, is actually much higher. It's almost 50% higher than all three of them put together. And so where should this optimization team put their focus? Well, obviously on CT1 and then maybe next CT2. <laughs> and so the point here is, is as you start to look at all your local data and you start to look at it per protocol, then you'll start to realize, oh, I could make a big difference if I focus on one scanner. Now you can see here on this one protocol, CT1 has is just it's it's grossly out out of proportion compared to the other three the other three CTs. But when you look at the total magnitude of that CT scanner, it's actually very low by way of total number of examinations compared to CT3. So most people would probably, their, their immediate reaction would be, oh, I use CT3 all the time. Therefore, if I go fix, or if I go work on CT3, I'm gonna work, I'm gonna make a bigger effect for more patients. But the reality is this page, this CT scanner is actually causing most of the radiation dose to, that, to the people that get imaged at this hospital. All right, so how do we how do we use this patient data to make educated decisions on how we change our protocols? So there's two ways to do this. Obviously, there's the we have all this data. You guys are going to eventually get Radometrics installed throughout Thailand, and that'll be a great way to get the data back to the national organization, so Penn, Dr. Penner Tai's group can create more DRLs and continue to update the DRLs going forward. But locally, as a as a uh, tool, we talked quite a bit about this in the first couple of weeks. But using that optim that that dose repository software gives you an idea of how well you, as an institution, are doing. For example, chest without contrast or abdomen and pelvis with contrast. You can look at the scatter profile as a function of the patient size, or if you don't have that patient age. And then you can fit this data. And, and I have on the other, on the next slide, I have some equations and you can use those equations to predict how the per, um, dose and noise would change if you make different adjustments. The other thing you can do, and this is a phantom that I actually own. It's a big old honking phantom. It's probably about this big and it probably weighs about, oh, I don't know, probably 60, 70 pounds. So it's, it's, it's something you could take with you to go to the gym if you really want to. But it's great because it has different thicknesses. And so this one phantom can mimic all of the various different patient sizes that would ever walk into your hospital. And so when I go scan this one phantom, depending on whatever protocol I want to optimize, I can determine what technique factors I need to change for each one of these patient sizes. The red line you see here is, according to this publication that just came out actually last year, they looked at this phantom and they asked, does this phantom mimic pa actual patient data? And that red line represents yes. So in other words, I have confidence that I can scan this phantom and I can go in and then start adjusting things, you know, image quality, dose and all that stuff. And I know that if I do it for, let's say this middle slice, it's gonna represent my patients that are, you know, 30 to 35 centimeters thick. 
And so that's a great thing. So you guys could, if you wanted to invest in maybe one of these phantoms and maybe a couple of them regionally and your medical physicists can take them around. Or like I said, you have this, your data, once you get your software, you can do these scatter plots and you can use these fits to your data and you can use these equations. So these equations are pretty straightforward where you can predict what the radiation dose output would be or sigma, which would be standard deviation. I should have, I'm sorry, I should have wrote here noise. This is the noise calculation. Based on the fitting function of this red line, which would tell you what alpha A1, B1 are, in this case, beta C1 and D1, then you can, based on the patient effective diameter or the patient size, you can predict what the CTDL, CTDI vol values and, and noise. So you can either use this phantom because you know which thickness the phantom is, or you can go back to your data and you can know what, once you fit your data, you can know what the size is. So if you're using, for example, that phantom, I just simply give you this, this plot, this, excuse me, this table, as you see here on my screen, comes from this publication. And so here you can see the A1, B1, alpha, C1, D1, beta. So if you go plug these values in, if you're doing, for example, a chest with hour or an, an abdominal pelvis with contrast, and you can, um, um, you can use these equations, uh, they're generic values. You can see they established it for a couple of their scanners, but you can see how the numbers are for the most part the same. If you wanted, you could just kind of average them together. But the idea here is you can go back to your data, you can fit them using this equation. I mean, fit them with an equation. And once you get those fitting functions, alpha, A1, and B1, then now you have these two calculation tools to just do whatever you want to make any kind of predictions. And what I'm saying here is you can make these predictions before you actually go in and start making changes on the protocols. And it kind of gives you a better idea that make sure you're doing the right thing before you <laughs> start exposing your patients. All right, so in conclusion, use the right size bow tie filter. That's the same as we talked about last time too. Make sure your patient is centered because that directly affects the radiation output to the patient. Use the proper acquisition factors. Where impossible, use the lowest KV. Obviously, really big patients can't use low KV, but where impossible, use the lowest KV. It enhances image contrast and it lowers patient dose. Uh, always, always, always use tube current modulation. I would say use organ dose modulation too. You're out nothing. It reduces the dose to the more anterior and oftentimes more sensitive organs. And there are those little niche ways that you can maybe potentially do it with, say, pregnant women. If you, ever, if you need to image a pregnant woman, then you have to do an abdomen image so you know you're going to be exposing, directly exposing the, the fetus, then... This is one of those things where maybe it's a great tool to have. And then how do you set the right noise index value? NISD, the quality reference dose, uh, quality reference uh, mass. And then how do those affect dose? We, we reviewed that. <clears throat> I've given you now several different equations in this plot, in this presentation so that you can use those to kind of do your calculations before you make changes. And then how do you set that for the proper slice thickness, clinical diagnostic tasks, et cetera? All right. So I think we can turn it over for questions now. Thank you so much, Sam, for your excellent talk and simplify things. So you made me feel like, yeah, it's not that bad to learn some physics because it's, it's, a, it's fun. At least I know some background and it's not that bad to understanding. So thank you so, so much for your excellent lectures. Well, I'm glad you liked physics so much. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I think I, I feel a lot, a lot better about the <laughs> physics thing behind the scene that in the past, I did not even know why it happened that way or what is it? <laughs> Just like I remember the number for the test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple of questions. So, I mean, based on your two lectures, if we want to write some manual for the technologies or for the radiologist to understand the basic principle for optimization. Can I say the first thing is to put the patient in the center of the, uh, of the country. And second thing is like, uh, you need to know the final product, final images 
for you to review like a bone window, soft tissue window, or which one is like the most important to you. So by that way, you can choose the correct filter or kernel to do the uh, uh, process to, to process the image. So the answer is yes. And always the best principle, the best way you can reduce the dose of the patient is taking the time to do the right thing. And our techno your technologists are, I know they're amazing, just like our technologists are amazing. They're trained to put the patient in the right place. They're trained to help them, to calm them down so they're not moving. They're not, they're not breathing hard. They're, you know, keep their heart rate low. So they're talking to them. They're being nice to them. All of those things, they may seem like, oh, they, that, that doesn't affect dose, right? That doesn't affect image quality, but actually it does. And so our technologists are usually the first people to help affect radiation dose and image quality. And so doing the right thing, taking the time to do the right thing, getting the patient centered, et cetera, keep them warm, do whatever it is that you have to, that is wonderful. And then the protocols that we build as a qual as a optimization team, radiologist, physicist, technologist, uh, IT specialist, their, their task is to look at all of those things we've talked about from the very, very beginning, you know, that long, long list of all of the settings and ask ourselves for this clinical indication for this protocol, what do we need to optimize? And so, yes, which bone window, you know, which noise index setting, all of those things are going to be set beforehand. And I believe very strongly that, that should be set and then put into the computer and programmed into the CT scanner. And that's probably how it is for you guys right now. So when the technologist gets the order, the patient, they get the patient in, they get them set up, they go sit down at the console, you know, they pull them off the work list and then they go, okay, based on either patient size or weight or however it is you guys have set up your protocols, they know to pick whatever protocol it is because it's either a chest, abdomen, or pelvis. And then it comes up, they do the localizer, they set it, they get the field of views nice and right so it's not too open. So they set the right field of views that obviously improves image quality. And then they scan them. And then all of the post-processing things happen. Iterative reconstruction is already established. Slice thickness is already established. If you have deep learning, or one day you will, that will also process in the background. You'll have usually one reconstruction kernel, maybe two, maybe three, because those are usually built up as secondary processing. And all of that just happens. And so then the patient can get off the table and can walk out the door. The technologist can finish their paperwork and move on. And all of that then goes off to the radiologist to review. It's just really important that we look at it holistically so that we can get all of that in the right order. And then that really just, so, you know, at some point you're going to have to kind of go through your protocols one by one. Let's look at focus on chest. Do we like that they're all five millimeters? Should we have one set of fives and one set of you know, 0.5s? Do we like the overall image quality? Is there too much noise for what we're doing? Should we lower our KV? And so you just kind of go through those questions as you go kind of body part to body part, task to task. And then that's the, at least that's the way I found as I've done this for the last few years. That's the best way I've found to go through it. If you look at all your protocols at once, you'll be overwhelmed. You will. And so just pick those ones. You have the national diagnostic reference levels. So you know which protocols are kind of upper on the high, high dose level, especially the ones that are above the national DRL. And the, we're going to focus on those. And we're going to go through that list of all the things that you mentioned. So you talk, we talk, you talk about like uh, the, the final protocol that we want, like a soft tissue, mainly like a for soft tissue window or bone window, how much difference in terms of radiation dose if we choose between like a soft tissue or bone window? Because sometimes, let's say some study, we need both of them. Yeah, so the reality is almost always you will set your dose to the soft tissue. And that's just going to be based on the fact that you know, maybe you'll do a five millimeter you know, you'll do a relatively thicker image for soft tissue because you need to average it so you get less dose in it, uh, excuse me, less noise. And you're going to set your kernels, you're going to set your noise index values or your, you know, the noise parameters that affect the output of the machine. And then you'll add whatever kernels you want to it. 
bone, long, whatever. And then bone, for example, you might want a thinner slice. So you get better resolution in the Z axis. Will the images look maybe a little noisier? Maybe. You know, a five millimeter soft tissue and a five millimeter bone image, the bone image is probably gonna look pretty good. Um, but at five millimeters, you're getting a lot of averaging. And so, you know, if you cut those thinner, now you're gonna be able to see a little bit more finely the detail on the Z axis, but because they're thinner, they're actually gonna have a little bit more noise. And so it actually kind of works out a little bit because the dose is set a little higher for the soft tissue versus the noise, uh, excuse me, for the bone. And so I would always default to the soft tissue. So default to the soft tissue and also thickness, maybe three millimeter thickness. You know, that, that really has a lot to do with preference. Uh, there are certain clinical indications where a thick image is actually helpful. You know, we talked about that in the brain, um, but in the body, because you know, for the most part, when you're certain slabs of the brain, you can kind of go a certain distance, three to five millimeters, and the anatomy doesn't change that much. But in the body, I mean, yeah, the lungs, you could maybe get go thicker or thinner, but it just, for the most part, our anatomy changes so much in our body that we really do need to have thinner slices. You know, five millimeters, probably the maximum you'll ever do in the body. Three millimeter, if you got a smaller patient, our little kids, we do everything consistently at three millimeters. But oftentimes we will do like a five millimeter and then we'll also let the radiologist look at the half millimeters. Now the half millimeter images are really grainy, really noisy images compared to the five millimeters. But if they're going through and they're looking at their fives and they're just like, there's something in between these two images I want to see, they need to see something thinner. And so we have those for them to look at. And now if they look at it and go, oh, this is too noisy, they can always call the, do the rate technologist and have them make them make one millimeters. You know, they can add them or, you know, start adding them together. Uh, where you're really busy, you know, I know Thailand, you know, when I was there in Bangkok and we were there, those, <laughs> those scanners were going 100 miles an hour. There were lots of patients. And so the reading room was very busy. So there's probably not a lot of room to make for the, tech, for the radiologist to call the technologist and say, hey, I need you to do this and this and this and this. And so you do, as an optimization team, need to kind of think about how, how the workflow is. And so you mm -hmm. kind of want to give the information to the radiologist that they need so they don't have to make any phone calls. True. Oh, you ask about class, uh, we have a lot of questions on the chat box. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see here. First question from Hai Pat. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. And then someone asked about Hitachi. So, yeah, so the reason I haven't really, admittedly, I, I did include the GE, Canon, Siemens, Philips. Those are the kind of the big four. Um, they, most places will have one of those four. Now, some I know some people have a Hitachi, especially over in Asia. There's probably a little bit more Hitachi. Uh, I'll I'll try to see if I can't find more information on Hitachi in the future. But admittedly, when you look at the publications, <laughs> there's actually not a lot of data on Hitachi. Um, but I will do my best to see if I can't include that in the next uh, the next lesson. Uh, lecture. I think that is the audience from Bhutan that he joining the lectures. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I have nothing against Hitachi. <laughs> I just admittedly, there's not a lot of Hitachi that is used in publications. All right, yeah, but Hattapai, uh, uh, If we says, use the low KV or auto KV selection in cooperate with the tube current modulation, aiming to reduce the patient dose and improve the signal uh, contrast noise ratio in the image, what should be concern or aware in different vendor because sometimes the higher dose is observed when using the low KV in some patient. Yeah. So, and that, the answer is if, when you do the auto KV, you do have to set your, your ranges because it's like, like as, as she mentioned that there are times when the system because it's trying to optimize the CNR, the contrast, it will allow the system to go too low on the KV. And so if you have a big patient, 
it might still try to use, for example, 80 kV, where it really shouldn't go lower than maybe 100 kV or 90 kV. In which case, the dose, I mean, the image quality does not look real good. Um, there are other times where then if the kV goes really low, if it's a big patient and you allow it to go to, say, 80 kV, well, the MA is going to go really, really high. And in that case, even though kV does change as the, as the square root, uh, excuse me, the square root, the, the square, it's a quadratic. If the MA goes really, really high, it might actually cause the dose to go too high. So setting limits to your auto KV system allows the system to um, act intelligently. In other words, you can't just walk in, turn on auto KV and just sit back. The system can at times go too far to the extremes. You have to give it its limits. Um, just to make sure I got. Yeah. And uh, the following questions on that things for the upcoming VLV construction, is there strategies taking into account for contrast noise ratio in algorithm? Um, the answer is no, currently no. There is, so when Canon developed their deep learning algorithm, they did their best to reduce noise and improve spatial resolution just a little. And the same with GE. If you go from their low to medium to deep learning to uh, selection, you reduce a lot of noise. If you go from the medium to the high, it tries to also sharpen the edges a little. But the reality is that's all the deep learning is doing is mostly just removing noise. And so you have to still make sure you've got the right KV set so that the overall contrast is the same. Now, will contrast to noise ratio go up? Yes, if you remove noise, contrast to noise ratio, obviously noise is in the denominator, the contrast to noise ratio will go higher. But they're not necessarily trying to drive that higher, they're just simply trying to remove the noise. So if you have the wrong KV set, then it, it, the contrast, the overall contrast in the image would not be good, but it would just be less noisy, if that makes sense. Um, next question is from Hong from Singapore. So during patient's positioning at the start of the examination, is the X-ray tube at the upper part of the gantry, 12 o'clock, or at the bottom of the gantry at 6 o'clock? Okay. So that's a great question. So when you walk into the room and you place that patient on the scanner, that x-ray tube, who knows where it is? It, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here. <laughs> when you turn on the lasers, the laser localizers, the tube will move to an exact position so the lasers could come out. Mm -hmm. And it's, if I remember right, it's like, it, I think it's, um, I think it's at 130 degrees. So zero, 80, 180, so 130 degrees is somewhere like right around here. But that's only so that the lasers can come out. Now you put the patient on the scanner and you go in and you do the anterior posterior, the AP localizer where the patient goes through and the tube is static. And now you go back and then it swings over to lateral and then the patients go through. So now you have your two localizer images, your quote unquote scouts. And You've set your parameters, you've set where your field of view is, your scan field of view, and then you hit go or next, the machine starts to rev up. Now, when you go to turn on and scan the patient through the machine, the machine, the x-ray tube will start at a random place every time. It doesn't only start exactly at zero. It could start here, it could start here, it could start here, it could start over here. And so we never know exactly where it will start perfectly random but we know exactly where it is when we do our localizers and we know where exactly it is when we have the laser light on <laughs> those are the only three places we know where the x-ray tube is excuse me uh, because the, uh, in in the uh, many recommendations they said that uh, we should put the uh, tube at the uh, at the bottom 
at six o'clock in the beginning so that the anterior sensitive organ will get less radiation dose yep. during the um, scan. And, yeah. and uh, I think in your the first image about the uh, uh, patient isocenter, the mm -hmm. tube is posterior. So mm -hmm. the position of a patient up or down uh, and the size display uh, on the skull depend on the position of, of the tube also. Yeah, that, and thank you. I should have pointed that out. I When I said the patient is wherever they are, it's always referenced to where the tube is. So if the tube is posterior, so below the table, if the patient is actually too low, then it's actually, they're closer to the tube. And so in that case, the patient would be magnified. So in that one slide, if you always consider, let me see if I can go back real quick. Nope, sorry, <laughs> wrong one. There we go. All right, you should be able to see my screen now. So the patient is always with respect to the tube. And I, so yeah, depending on where you start, if, if your tube in this case is below the table I'm, um, and the patient is lower, then they would still be magnified. So yes, thank you, Panyutai, for pointing that out. Can you explain to me how to do this มันมันจะมีอยู่ที่ที่เครื่องเลยตอนที่เทคเขาตัดซีทีเครื่องมันจะบอกว่าหลอดเนี่ยอยู่ข้างบนหรืออยู่ข้างล่างแล้วให้เราเปลี่ยนได้ปกติเขาจะเซตมาให้ให้อยู่ทางด้านบนคราวนี้มันก็จะมีคนที่เขาแนะนำเขาบอกว่าให้หลอดไปอยู่ด้านล่างซะพอมันปล่อยแสงตรงสเกลออกมามันจะโดนทางด้านหลังซึ่งเป็นกล้ามเนื้อเป็นกระดูกก่อนมันก็จะมาผ่านถึงไทรอยเบรสหรือว่าไอเลนส์เนี่ยได้ได้น้อยกว่าหรือลังไข่ก็ตามเพราะมันต้องต้องผ่านส่วนข้างหลังนะคะพอพอเสร็จแล้วเนี่ยพอการที่มาอยู่ตรงนี้พอหลอดมันมาอยู่ข้างล่างปุ๊บเอ่อมันก็จะกลับกันคือถ้าคนไข้อยู่ล่างภาพมันก็จะใหญ่ถ้าเกิดภาพใหญ่บอกขนาดของคนไข้ว่าโตกว่าความเป็นจริงถ้าเกิดว่า AEC มันถูกเซตโดยการที่ดูจากไซส์ของคนไข้ด้วยมันก็จะกลายเป็นโอเวอร์โดสตรงนั้นได้เพราะถ้าถ้าถ้าคิดว่าคอนเซปต์เป็นอย่างนั้นนะคะแต่ว่าพี่ไม่ค่อยแน่ใจจริงๆว่าว่า AEC เนี่ยเขาเซตเขาเซตเซตจากสเกลว่ะแน่ๆแต่ส่วนหนึ่งอาจจะเป็นไซส์แล้วก็อีกส่วนหนึ่งอาจจะเป็นเดนซิตี้แล้วก็มีเครื่องของบางยี่ห้อเนี่ย AEC มันจะเปลี่ยนเวลาที่ที่อะไรล่ะกำลังสแกนด้วยแล้วมันก็จะเพิ่มอินโฟเมชันเข้าไปเพราะฉะนั้นแต่ละเครื่องมันทำงานไม่เหมือนกันคนละยี่ห้อมันจะทำงานไม่เหมือนกันด้วยบางบางยี่ห้อเขาบอกว่าต้องเป็นสเกล AP ด้วยสเกล PA ไม่ได้บางยี่ห้อบอกว่าต้องสเกลและทะเลาด้วยอะไรอย่างเงี้ย AEC มันคือไอตัวทิวมอเตอร์เรตติ้งค่ะถูกไหมคะค่ะถามถามได้ที่จังหวะจะไม่แน่ใจจะถามถามคุณแซมเออเซมต่อไปที่เอ่อ tube current modulation among different vendors they have the different way like some some say they use the two scalp view and some say they have to do the frontal from from the top not from the bottom and some say they use the last scalp to 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 use in the AEC, and some some vendor they said they they use the uh, information during the scan for the next scan, and some and some don't. So yep. they're quite complex, and the yes. <laughs> for the so most part, they in the past it really mattered if you did one or two scouts the last one was the most important one because back in the day it depended on that was the one they used the tube current modulation 
that's not as true anymore. Nowadays, they use if you do two, they're gonna do they're gonna try to use both information the the actual uh, attenuation profiles from both of them. Um, so don't worry too much about what order. I actually personally prefer to do when you do the lateral first then you can see if the patient is centered and then if you know the patient is centered i mean let's say they're not let's say they're really bad well then you go fix it you move the table and then you do another lateral scan and then if they're good then you do you switch it over and you do the posterior anterior or the ap one either way and then now You've done maybe three scans, but there's that's okay. If you do the AP first, you don't know if they're centered. And then you do the lateral, oh, they're not centered. Well, you have to do it all again. And so it's just, that's why I personally prefer to do a lateral first and then the anterior posterior. Now, Siemens, you, you mentioned this. Siemens is one of the few scanners out there that you do the scout images, or in their case, the topograms, and then that will pick the tube current modulation. Now, once you have the tube current modulation, as it is scanning, what happens is every time it goes 180 degrees, it takes how much attenuation it passed through and it uses it to modify the next set of MA for the next 180 degrees. So, excuse me, even though it's already calculated what it thinks, it will slightly modify that in real time. It's actually a great technique. So do you still need to do your topograms or your scouts? Yes. And does it matter which order? If the vendor says to do it in a specific order, yeah, you should do it that way. But for the most part, more modern CT scanners, it, it doesn't matter that much anymore because they use them both. I see. Uh, one more question from the chat box from Ajahn Petchali. Ajahn, do you want to ask me? Yeah, let's okay. see. Yep, so to conclude, my understanding in case of the same patient with same CT scanner and the same CTDI vol value, but different scanning situation, we've, we may have different noise levels. So if it's the exact same patient with the exact same output and they're in the exact same location, the noise should still be the same. Um, if, if they mean by different scanning situations, like different clinical indications or different uh, clinical uh, protocols or reasons why they're scanning, then they can definitely change the CTDI value or they can change the noise value to make it lower or higher. If you're doing an inherently high contrast image, such as calcium scores, or you're doing lung, uh, uh, you're doing a lung image where you're looking for METs, then there's a lot of already contrast there, so you can reduce the dose. If, I hope that's what they were asking. And then the other question they had was, can we how do we find? the image quality techniques. So I'm going to actually flip over. I pulled up an image on my other screen. Okay, so now you should see my desktop. So here is just chest. one image. Yeah, so you see my chest image right there. So if you look at the DICOM information. We don't see it yet. Oh, you don't see anything? Um, yes, mm -hmm. we saw your screen. You, okay, so you see the image over here and you see a bunch of words over here? Yes. Okay, perfect. So this is the DICOM information from this particular CT scan. Um, it's going to have all your basic stuff, information, you know, the vendor, the type of imaging it's doing. It's going to tell you down here, uh, basic information such as, you know, which way it's spinning, how fast it's spinning, the output, 
know, what's the MA for this slice or this image right here? It's going to tell you, you know, the focal spot size. It's going to tell you the reconstruction kernel. And then it's going to have a bunch of numbers here <laughs> that really, you know, like, for example, that I know is my pitch because I just because I set it up. That's my total collimation. And so it gives me the information about how this was acquired. The question was, does it tell you about the image quality? And so the one thing that it doesn't show you is the noise index value or the SD value, or if it's a Siemens value, the, the quality reference mass. That stuff is almost always hidden down here. Oh, my system doesn't even have it. There are, yep. So normally your, your pack system may have, so at the bottom of the DICOM list, there'll be things called private tags. And unfortunately mine just doesn't have it. And in those private tags, it will list it, but it won't tell you what it is. So if you have a GE or a Canon or a Hitachi or whoever you have, you may need to just reach out to that vendor and say, your noise index value, what is your private tag number? Is it, you know, 7005 comma 100F? And if it is, then you can go and you can find it. But up here, where they list all of the other really important information, unfortunately, they do not list the noise index value. So they, they give you all the other information that help you understand what the image quality is, such as MA and KV and slice thickness and uh, all these other things, but it's that one piece of information they don't quite show. And so that's unfortunate, but you, it is there, it's hidden, but it's there. And so my recommendation is talk to your, your CT vendor and ask them which private tag they hide it in. And then you would find it out. <laughs> So I guess the noise index, you have like a standard number or like a table for the noise index for each like a scan or like a each organ, right? Uh, for each slice. So, um, well, okay. So if you have, for example, this, this patient you see right here, I, may, I would have set up an SD of, um, I don't even know how big this patient, this patient probably had an SD value of 12.5. I'm just uh -huh. guessing based on their size. In other words, every slice would be 12.5. The way GE and Canon set it up, it's the same throughout the entire, the, the entire uh, scan series. Now, if I put my ROI, you know, over here, and I measure my standard deviation, well, that's a bad place. This is a 0.5. Hold on. I got to get a. There we go. I got to get a three millimeter image up. So let me put my ROI here, put it over here. Now my standard deviation is almost eight. So I was probably wrong. It's not 12.5. It's probably 10 or something like that. But now you can see how the standard deviation is different. If I come over here, uh, let's go a little deeper into the body. Well, it's a little too far, but whatever. <laughs> let's, let's put it in my ROI here, put that there. Now my standard deviation is 14. So it's the same SD value or noise index value, but the noise itself changes a little bit with with um with the patient thickness now you you remember um here i can flip this down uh, you can still see my screen right uh -huh. good Not right here so remember noise output isn't flat I mean, GE tries to do it flat, but even GE is not perfectly flat. So as the patient gets thicker, as they go along, it, it does change a little bit. So that's why you're seeing over here, as we go into the pelvis compared to the, whoa, <laughs> all of a sudden really big chest. 
so when you go from the chest down to the pelvis, um, oh my goodness, I, my computer doesn't like to work. It's midnight. <laughs> it's it's one a.m. already. It's that's why, yeah, that's why my computer's not working. <laughs> So when I go from a relatively thin part of the body to a thicker part of the body, the noise profile does change a little bit. So that's one thing to consider. I see. All right. I don't, I lost my chat. Let's see if there's any more questions. There is one more question about the bow tie filter. So is the bow tie filter, uh, filter change when we do localization images? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the answer is no, we do not change it. Which filter do they use? They use the large filter. And that's because when we do a, a localizer, we're using a full field of view. And so that's why when you see the localizer, the patient, you can see the whole patient, arms, legs, everything. It's the full 50 centimeter field of view. Um, I've... I'd be, it'd be interesting if I went back and I actually, because on a smaller patient, um, no, nope, it, it's always the same. I'm almost a hundred percent certain you can't, you could change it if you want, but it's almost always the same. So you don't have to worry about the bow tie filter when you're doing the localizer. It, it's just, it's automatically set to the largest. So, but when you say like, you change the filter, it's just like a click, right? Like a one click from the, from the screen or something, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, um, here is, let me grab my image quality image talk and let's get back up to the bow tie filter right here. So for example, right here on, this is a Canon, each, each vendor will have it in a different place. But if I click on the filter, then I get to choose which one I want. So I could in theory change it, but for the localizer, I wouldn't because it's, like I said, it's a large field of view. You, you want it to stay big because you want to be able to see the whole image. I don't know if I have a localizer here. Nope, I don't. But yeah, you have the opportunity. It's just a, it's a simple click. But this is something that you would establish as an optimization team. When you build the protocol, you set which protocol uh, filter, you set the KV, you set the noise index value, you set all of that. And then the technologist doesn't have to worry about that. The technologist has to worry about the patient. Is the patient centered? Is the patient happy? Is the patient responding? They have to worry about the IV injection. They have to worry about all of those kind of things. We don't want them to be worried about picking the right filter. We don't want them to be worried about picking all of those types of things, if that makes sense. I see. That makes sense, yeah. Ajahn Pan, me, come time. Um, I would like to ask about the CT neck. You mentioned about the CT spine in the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. If uh, we would like to do the CT neck, use the same concept as the C spine, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so if you're doing more like a soft tissue instead of uh, the C spine, mm -hmm. um, the answer is yes. For us, for our soft tissue necks and our C-spine or bony, we start at the shoulders and we go up. And then we had to make sure we set the right minimum MA. That was, those are our two things we found. Yeah, whatever you do for, you know, the neck in general, I would do the same. Even though it's different clinical indication, it's still the same anatomy. You know what I mean? Yeah. You may need a little less noise. So you may need to set your minimum MA a little higher. Whereas in bony anatomy, that might be okay, even though it's not perfect. This might be okay right here, what you see on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas soft tissue, this might not be enough, in which case you might need a little bit more radiation. Yeah, I would like to ask more because there is some requests is like a neck and chest. And if we like to do it in continuous, yeah. and probably the, uh, with the hand up. Mm -hmm. That, that, that is a trick. So if your arms are up and you're trying to image the neck, <laughs> you're yeah. going to have a lot neck, of artifacts. Neck, neck chest in continuous. Oh, should not do that. Should, should they split the examination? In a, 
The answer is whatever is best for your patient. We, you know, <laughs> the way we do it, we split ours. I think we do. We do, split we do our neck with our arms down and then we put the arms up and we do the chest. And that's just the best way for the image quality. If the patient can't move their arms or the patient, uh, it's a trauma case and you don't want to move their arms, mm -hmm. then you have to, add, or you, you don't want to keep moving the arms is what I meant to say. Then you need to pick the, the most important question to ask. Because if you put your arms by your chest, you're going to get a lot of artifact through the chest, especially down in the spine area. And if that's where the trauma is, then you got to move your arms up. If the arms, if you need to put the arms up for the neck, the other thing you can do is instead of putting them straight up, you can put them out a little bit. So the arms are above the face. So, but we always, we split ours personally. Wow. Thank you. We have yeah. a very, very productive discussion today. And yeah. Interesting questions mm -hmm. and a lot of homework to you, to you too, <laughs> to find out the Hitachi. <laughs> <laughs> I will see if I can't find Hitachi. I, yeah. um, I've used Hitachi MR quite a bit. Hitachi uh -huh. does a lot more MR than CT. <laughs> so thank you so much, Sam, for giving a lectures and during midnight <laughs> for us. Yeah, at midnight and 1 a.m. So thank you so much. And so for the audience, some of you who are watching, เอ่อจะมีลิงก์ส่งให้ทําประเมินนะคะในเรื่องของ evaluation นะคะรบกวนทําประเมินให้เสร็จภายในวันพฤหัสตอนเที่ยงคืนนะคะเพื่อที่วันศุกร์จะได้รับใบ certificate แล้วก็คะแนน CME นะคะแล้วก็วันศุกร์จะได้รับลิงก์ของการประชุมในอาทิตย์ถัดไปนะคะมีหลายคําถามถามมาหลังไหมว่าเอ๊ะดูย้อนหลังได้ไหมหรือว่าอะไรยังไงนะคะสามารถดูย้อนหลังได้นะคะทาง YouTube Imaging Academic Outreach Center นะคะแล้วก็สามารถดูดูย้อนหลังได้ทาง Facebook เหมือนกันนะคะแต่เท่าที่ตัวเองสังเกตดูแล้วเนี่ยใน YouTube เนี่ยภาพจะชัดกว่าใน Facebook นะคะแล้วก็ PDF lecture นะคะจะมีให้สำหรับท่านที่ลงทะเบียนโดยที่ท่านต้องล็อกออนเข้าไปนะคะในอีเมลที่ท่านท่านใช้ลงทะเบียนนะคะแล้วเดี๋ยวทางเจ้าหน้าที่เขาส่งพาสเวิร์ดไปให้แล้วเดี๋ยวให้ให้เขาส่งให้ใหม่อีกทีนึงนะคะว่าจะใช้พาสเวิร์ดอันไหนในการเข้าไปดูนะคะเพื่อได้ดาวน์โหลดเอกสารประกอบการประชุมนะคะ so for the international audience uh, we gonna send you a, a link for evaluation please complete the evaluation by midnight on the Thursday so on Friday you will get a, a certificate with the CME credit and also on Friday you will get a link for the next week talk we also have a PDF lectures uh, put in the uh, website so you need to log on using your username and password so the username is the your email address when you register to to attend the lectures and password uh, we're gonna send the password to you again so you can log on and download the PDF lectures and If you want to uh, review the lectures, you can watch on uh, YouTube, Imaging Academic Outreach Center channel, and also on the Facebook Imaging Academic Outreach Center. But YouTube, I think the image quality and the quality of the video on YouTube is a bit better compared to the Facebook. 